प्रवेश्य मम वाच मां प्रसुप्ता संजीवयदि अखिलशक्तिधर स्वधाम्न अन्यामिश्च हस्तचरण श्रवण प्रजादे प्राणान्नमो भगवदे पुरुषाय तिभ्य तुमेव माता च पिता तुमेव तुमेव बिंधुश्च सखा तुमेव तुमेव विद्या द्रविणम तुमेव तुमेव सर्वम मम देवदेव Let's meditate on the divine spirit which is present in everyone's heart. Om Sahana Vavadu Sahana Ubhunattu Sahaviryam Karavavahe ಪೂರ್ಣಮದ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಿದ ಪೂರ್ಣಾತ್ ಪೂರ್ಣಮುದಚ್ಯದೆ ಪೂರ್ಣಸ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಾದಾಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವ ಅವಶಿಷ್ಯತೆ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ದ ಇನ್ವಿಸಿಬಲ್ ಈಸ್ ದ ಇನ್ಫಿನಿಟ್ ದ ವಿಸಿಬಲ್ ಟು ಈಸ್ ದ ಇನ್ಫಿನಿಟ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಇನ್ಫಿನಿಟ್ ದ ವಿಸಿಬಲ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಇನ್ಫಿನಿಟ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟೆನ್ಷನ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಕಮ್ ಔಟ್ ದ ಇನ್ಫಿನಿಟ್ ರಿಮೈನ್ಸ್ ದ ಸೇಮ್ even though the infinite universe has come out of it om peace 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 so in the last class we were dealing with the third mantra of this upanishad i have given a brief outline in fact this mantra contains a warning to those who completely neglect the spiritual dimension of their personality asurya namate lokah andhena tamasavrutah tamste pretya abhigachanti ekecha atmahano janah people who completely forget or neglect the spiritual dimension of their personality are called atmahana which literally means somebody who kills the atman atman could mean the infinite soul and also oneself means they destroy themselves those who think that that they are nothing more than the body and mind and those who are completely ignorant of the spiritual dimension of the personality they lose the spiritual world and they get lost in the material world that's the meaning so self destruction means getting lost in the material world shankaracharya gives a very graphic description of how this happens to common people to ignorant people in a very well known verse in the viveka chodamani it's called the crust jewel of discrimination discrimination here means wisdom so let us say the crust jewel of wisdom there is a famous verse in the viveka chudamani shabda dibhi pancha bhireva pancha panjatta mapusso gunena baddhah kuranga madanga padanga meenah bhringa nara pancha bhiranchitakkim this is the mantra i shall translate it in english Shankaracharya gives a graphic description of how different creatures get caught and lose their life and compares their plight to that of a man an ignorant man a man who doesn't care for spiritual realization is a very graphic description he gives the example of five types of creatures kuranga madanga padanga meena bhanga means the deer elephant mouth a flies fish and 
certain small creatures who move about from one place to another, going in search of flower plants to drink honey. Different creatures. Mostly they appear during rainy season in the tropical regions. No, Shankaracharya says that each of these creatures loses its life because its mind it is dragged into the outside world by one sensory perception, by one of the senses. See, take first example. Kuranga means deer. In ancient times, hunters used to play on some crude musical instruments. So listening to this voice, deer will, deers will come out of their hiding holes and they will start running fast and they will be killed by the hunter. So they lose their life because they are dragged out because, uh, by their uh, sense, sense of hearing because they are, they are drawn by the sense of hearing. Sravanindriya it is called. When they listen to the voice coming from the hunter's crude musical instrument, they come out running and they are killed and they lose their life. And then elephants. You know, elephants move in herds, groups. So when they move in search of water from place to place, huge elephant families, there will be 600, 200 elephants sometimes. And they will be, move, they will be touching each other. The baby elephant will be looked after by the mother elephants. They will be touching each other. So it's called Togindriya means the, the, the sense of touch. Sense of touch. The, because of their attraction towards Togindriya, the sensory perception related to touching, they lose their life. What happens? Generally those who catch, they catch elephants will dig huge pits and the elephants will lose their way and they get caught because they will be trapped and they will fall in their pits and they will be caught, tamed or maybe killed. Then flies and moths. When you start a fire, when this fire start blazing, these flies and moths will see this fire and they will mistake this blazing fire as something very attractive and they fly towards that fire and they, are, they, they, they will fall in the fire and they lose their life. Then fish. So moths and flies lose their life because they see something and that their minds are dragged outside by their eyes, by netrendriya, means the sense of vision. So sense of hearing, sense of touch, and sense of vision. Fourth one is sense of taste. Now, how fish, I don't know much about it from a practical point of view, but those who have got fishing as a hobby may know very well. Fishing rod, there will be a hook attached to a fishing rod, and there will be something which uh, will attract the fish, maybe it's this, the smell, something attached to the hook, and the fish will be drawn towards it, and then the fish will lose, a fish, is caught, fish may be caught and they lose their life. So they lose their life because they drag, their minds are dragged outside by their sense of uh, taste. And last, some creatures which normally, uh, which are normally found during rainy season in the tropical countries. They move from one flower plant to another flower plant in search of honey. At that time, some other bigger creatures will come and catch them and they'll be killed. So these five senses of perception, the sense of hearing, the sense of touch, the sense of vision, the sense of taste and the sense of uh, smell, 
these five senses drag their mind to the outside world and they lose their life. Then Shankaracharya says, Nara Panjabhiranchita Kim, Naranam Vishay Kim Vaktavyam, that is the commentary by Sangeri Shankaracharya, when Sangeri Shankaracharya has written a famous commentary on Yoga Chudananda. What to speak of the plight of man? See, men are drawn towards the outside world simultaneously by all the five senses. Because all these five senses are active in the case of an ordinary man. Simultaneously, mind is drawn towards different objects of hearing, vision, taste, smell and touch. Now, what to speak of man? So, this is the plight of man. Then what happens? No, okay. Man loses his awareness of spiritual reality. And such people are called Atmahana. Now, how does, uh, how, how can an individual slowly grow from this uh, level of uh, sensory world, sensory perception to a higher level of spiritual consciousness? As mentioned in the Sixth and seventh mantra you already mentioned. Yastu sarvani bhudani, atmani eva anupashyati, sarva bhudastu cha atmanam tato navijugupsati. This shows the ethical dimension of Advaita philosophy. One who experiences the presence of the entire creation within himself and his own presence in every living being in this world. Such a person cannot hate anybody because he identifies himself with the entire creation. He is perpetually living in, in, the, in the awareness of his unity with the whole creation. And so the seventh mantra, Yasmin Sarvani Bhudani Atmai Vabhud Vijanataha Tatra Ko Moha Kashoka Ekatum Anupaschataha. The seventh mantra, this sloka, this verse, describe the psychological aspect of the highest spiritual experience. The sixth one, which I mentioned just now, is to Sarvani Bhudani, Atmani Eva Anupasyadi, Sarva Bhudastu Chatmanam Tatone Vijigupsade. That sixth sloga describes the ethical, the humanistic dimension of this spiritual awareness or Advaita Anubhuti is called the experience of uh, unity with the, the entire creation. Now, the question arises, how can an ordinary man living this world, who is dragged, whose mind is dragged the outside world to a sensory objects, by all the sense, by all the five senses of perception, simultaneously, how can such a man evolve to a higher level of spiritual consciousness? This question arises. Uh, this, uh, this question is dealt with very elaborately in a very uh, graphic style in the form of a dialogue in another important work that is Bhagavata Purana. It is the most important and most philosophical of the Puranic literature. There, you can get a clear picture of the gradual evolution of a primitive man with primitive consciousness to a higher level of spiritual consciousness. It comes in the form of a dialogue. Seven, sorry, nine great sages uh, went to a king to visit him. The sages name the, the, the names of the seven the nine sages are given in the Bhagavad Gita. And it comes if you are interested, you can it comes in the eleventh book. It is called Skantha, second chapter of Bhagavad Purana. Nine great sages go to a great emperor, a king. And the king asks nine very important 
philosophical questions and these nine sages and give answer to each of these questions kavir hari randadiksha prabuddha pippalayana avihotrodha drumilas chamasa karabhajana this is a sloka i give this is a list of nine sages they need not very important from, the, from our con, from the standpoint of the present context kavi hari andariksha prabuddha pippalayana avihotra chamasa karabhajana these are nine sages are mentioned i am not going to those details now there are three important verses which actually give uh, the evolution of man's concept of godhead or the uh, picture of the evolution of a man's concept of absolute reality now our concept of god or absolute reality depends upon our own spiritual evolution this is a simple fact see a primitive man believes that god is somebody who stands outside very cruel and compromising like a drill sergeant with a rod in his hand ready to punish his creation sending humanity either to hell or heaven depending upon their actions now this this concept is not wrong according to vedanta vedanta doesn't negate any concept vedanta only upanishads only tell you that there is a higher concept of absolute reality so what i said was this that is our idea of god is practically our own creation it doesn't mean that we create god our understanding of god depends upon our own spiritual or cultural or intellectual evolution the three verses in bhagavata purana gives in a descending order three levels of man's concept of absolute reality first shloka gives how a picture of how a highly evolved spiritual person looks upon god as present in every living being and he himself being present in god that's the concept and then there are those who are not so highly evolved spiritually they are not so highly evolved but they are they have faith in god they go to temples they go to churches they go to different places of worship but then they are not able to see unity between god and his creation then at the last category there are those who are primitive minded they believe well if i go to a place of worship maybe temple church or mosque whatever may be then god is pleased i can go and pray to god and there ends the matter it's a kind of contract and then we can do whatever we want so six days you can live as as we like and the seventh day you go to a place of worship and give a count of our activities and then next day onwards we can do whatever we want we can live as we like now this is not wrong but this is only the beginning the kindergarten of spiritual life as swami vivekananda said kindergarten of spiritual life first shloka is sarva bhuda sarva sarva bhudeshu yat pasye bhagavad bhavam atmanah bhutani bhagavadi atmani esha bhagavadottam it comes in the 11th skanda 11th book of sec- second chapter 11th book second chapter of the bhagavata purana there the great sage gives answer to a question put to him by the great king by the great emperor the emperor puts a number of questions how to live in this world how to cross the ocean of ignorance and how to combine devotion and knowledge how to practice karma yoga all these subjects are dealt with in this in this context so first the great sage antariksha the great sage says those who are highly evolved experiences the presence of god within himself and within everything in this world in that sense there is no distinction between god and his creation 
There is nobody, nothing in this world where the presence of God is not felt. Everything in this world is an expression of God. But very, we very often separate the entire phenomena into subjects and objects. So we are the subjects and the rest of the world is an object. But those who have reached the highest level of spiritual evolution, experience, not just sees or thinks, but experiences the presence of God in every, not only living being, in everything in this world. Sarva, Bhutani means anything which is created. That is Bhutani. Not only human beings, not only the members of the animal kingdom, but everything in this world is an expression of God. So the separation between creation and creator completely vanishes. Every minute he experiences his unity with God. Now for such a person, Every act becomes an act of worship. Every moment becomes an experience of the presence of God. The distinction between formal and informal religion vanishes. Every minute of existence becomes an experience of his unity with God. This is the, the, this is the experience of those who have reached the highest level of spiritual realization. But this is not possible for all. And this experience is implied in the sixth and seventh verse of Isha Vasya Upanishad. Giving uh, an idea of its psychological and ethical dimension. And what about those who have not reached this level of spiritual evolution? This is the highest level. Maybe a Buddha or a Shankaracharya or a Siddhama Vishnu or a Christ or a Vivekananda, many of the great mystics may, may have reached this level of experience. But there are those who have not reached this level of experience. What about them? Their spiritual experience is uh, explained, described in a very memorable, very, very uh, beautiful verse in the same Context in the next verse, Ishare tadadhi neshu bali seshu dhishat sucha prema maitri kripa upeksha yakkaroti samadhyamaha. This is the sloka. I shall explain in English. Now, what about those who have not reached the highest level of spiritual evolution? They have to follow certain rules and rules and regulations. They have to follow certain do's and don'ts. You can't mix with everybody. See, a Christ or a Buddha or a Sri Ramakrishna can deal with the worst sinners of the world. Sri Ramakrishna could convert Girishandra Ghosh. Shankaracharya could convert Todak Achary. Buddha could convert, there is a story of a great robber, Angulimala, whom Buddha converted into a great saint, and Jesus Christ. And many of the great spiritual personalities who experienced this unity of existence could convert even sinners, even downtrodden people uh, into saints and sages. But if an ordinary man goes about trying to convert others, he will be converted rather. If without and before reaching this level of spiritual unity, if we try to convert other people, if we get, um, if, you, if you mix freely with uh, robbers or thieves, slowly we find, well, stealing is not, absolute, not absolutely wrong. If it uh, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe if there is a pressing need, nothing wrong in stealing. Slowly our own mind will change and the thief or robber will convert our, us into his line of thinking. This danger is implied in this loka. Ishwarita dadhineshu bali seshu dishut sucha prema maitri kripa upeksha. Now, Towards God, we must have pure devotion, prema. And towards those who are devotees of God, we must have an attitude of friendliness. And towards those who are not aware of the existence of God, who are ignorant of 
any spiritual values. We must have an attitude of sympathy. We must be, we should not hate them. At the same time, we must not go very close to them, but we must have an attitude of sympathy. We must help them. Bali says so. Then there are those, there are those who hate God, who uh, speak against spiritual values, who will tell you, well, nothing wrong, no need to go to any temple, church, or place of worship, no need to read any religious scripture. This world is nothing more than our own physical body, so you enjoy as much as possible. A kind of um, you know, utilitarianism or epicureanism, whatever it may be called. You know. Now, what, what should be our attitude towards those people? We should keep a distance from them. So upeksha means an, act, an attitude of indifference. If we hate them, the hatred also will be a kind of bondage. Because if you hate a man, that also will bind you to him. If you go very close to them, to undesirable, I mean, if you mix very freely with undesirable people, then their mind will influence our mind. That will, be, that will lead to spiritual self-destruction. So, we should keep an attitude of indifference towards them. And then, the same text goes on explaining the attitude of those who belong to the lowest level of spiritual evolution. They are called Prakrita Bhakta. I mean, Prakrita means Prakritehe Prathama Bha, means the first stage, let us say the kindergarten of religious life. The beginning of religious life. There it says, they uh, they go to they go to places of worship. They bow down to um, uh, may, may they, they they may show their respect towards um, uh, spiritual personalities outwardly, or as ritual mechanically they may go to a place of worship. External rituals they may perform. But at the same time, coming out of the place of worship, they will hate everybody else. So you cannot simultaneously love God and hate His creation. It is not possible. But then, we don't condemn them. They are only the beginners in spiritual life, in spiritual journey. That's what the slogan says. Now, the Bhagavata Purana gives the picture in a descending order we have to approach it from an ascending order. So the last mention sloga describes the attitude of the beginner in spiritual life. Well, instead of spending all the time in material pursuits, it's better once a while to go to a place of worship, if at all, if, 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 at least mechanically practice some rituals. Because slowly, one evolves, maybe not in this life, in the next life, slowly, this may develop into a higher level of spiritual consciousness and one may reach a, the next level of spiritual evolution. And then ultimately, it may take a long time because Hindu religion, Upanishad philosophy, Vedanta, believes in the law of karma and the theory of rebirth and uh, reincarnation. So whatever you do is never lost. Even if you hear once some good idea, if, uh, if you listen to some good ideas, even once in life, that will not be lost. That will find its expression, if not in this life, maybe after several lives. That's why I was telling in, in, for, in an informal discussion. Those who come here to listen to Upanishadic talk, must have listened to Banishadi talk sometime in their past. I'm, I'm referring to those who are coming for the first time. Unless they have heard or thought of this great spiritual idea sometime in their past life, it, is not be, it will not be possible for them to come and enjoy spiritual ideas. So that means in Vedantic philosophy, nothing is lost and it is never late. Nothing is lost. 
even the minutest act of spiritual practice will be like a deposit that you are putting in a bank which you can draw, you can draw your check if not in this life next life so nothing is lost and it's never late so this idea is implied in this four five shlokas so third shloka i already explained no need to go further but it deals with uh, uh, it, with those who completely neglect their spiritual personality the spiritual aspect of their personality and those who get a chance to come out of this cycle and hear this great grand ideas at least once in their life the door is open before them to a higher progress and then the fourth and fifth verse we already explained uh, the eternal nature the omnipresent omnipresent nature of atman anejh degam manasu jiviyo the language as i explained earlier it is unmoving it is one at the same time it is faster than manasah jiviha means faster than mind and then even indriyas even senses cannot reach them because it is faster than mind Fa- mind is much faster than senses it is faster than mind because it is present everywhere there is nowhere where it is not present we have already dealt with this fourth shloka so i won't repeat and the fifth shloka we have to take up today fifth one tat ejadi तत् न एजदि तत् दूरे तत् उ अंतिके तत् अंतरस्य सर्वस्य तत् उ सर्वस्य अस्य बाह्यतः दिस इज द फिफ्थ श्लोक आई हैव पुट इन क्रॉस ऑर्डर देन आई शुड एक्सप्लेन इन इंग्लिश तत् मींस दैट आत्मन दैट एब्सोल्यूट रियलिटी एजदि मींस मूविंग इट्स मूविंग एंड देन नेक्स्ट उपनिषद सेज that ne is the it is not moving last time i already explained and i should explain this once more i believe the upanishads want to explain what cannot be explained in fact the entire upanishad literature the entire vedic literature is an attempt to explain the inexplicable it is an attempt to describe what cannot be described it is an attempt to define what cannot be defined then you may ask the you may you may say then why can't open it straight away say it cannot be explained let us leave it blank now the point is the upanishads want to drive home the idea that it cannot be explained by resorting to a technique it uses bo- words in both the negative and positive senses so it says it is not moving why because it is present everywhere it is omnipresent does it mean that it is lifeless do atman is present everywhere do atman is not responsible for any action no action is possible without the presence of atman in us so in the gita there is a famous shloka karmani akarmaye pashyed akarmani cha karmayeha sa buddhiman manusheshu sa yukta krishna karma krutha that there is a famous shloka saha yukta ha buddhiman krishna karma krut explain the sri krishna says he is the yogi yogi let us say the one who has reached the highest level of spiritual consciousness the man of wisdom and he buddhiman again it means a man of a man who has reached a very high level of discrimination discrimination should be understood in its true philosophical sense normally when we use the word discrimination it means uh, it may have a negative connotation but in vedantic philosophy or when we translate vedantic language vedantic words into english as discrimination what is implied is this the ability to understand what is eternal and what is non eternal 
ನಿತ್ಯ ಅನಿತ್ಯ ವಸ್ತು ವಿವೇಕ ದಿಸ್ ಈಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಮೀನ್ ಬೈ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರಿಮಿನೇಷನ್ ದಿ ಎಬಿಲಿಟಿ ಟು ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ರಿಯಲ್ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಎಟರ್ನಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅನ್ರಿಯಲ್ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಎಟರ್ನಲ್ ದಿಸ್ ಈಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಮೀನ್ ಬೈ ದ ವರ್ಡ್ ನಿತ್ಯ ಅನಿತ್ಯ ವಸ್ತು ವಿವೇಕ ನಿತ್ಯ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಎಟರ್ನಲ್ ಅನಿತ್ಯ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಎಟರ್ನಲ್ ನೌ the ability to understand what is real and to discriminate it to understand it as distinct from what is unreal this is viveka now the upanishads want to tell you that this reality cannot be explained but instead of saying that it cannot be explained the upanishad the vedic seers used one technique they used words in the both negative and positive sense so you find upanishad astulam ananu akrasum adirgham you find such terms you find that reality is not gross it is not subtle it is not long it is not short it is not internal it is not external then what is it it only means if you use the word uh, internal you can understand something internal only in relation to something which is not internal you can understand something as dirgha means long only in relation to something which is short you can think of movement only in relation to something which is uh, and moving so movement implies the relationship of something in relation to something which is not moving similar so now movement and the absence of movement can be used only in the relative sense in the absolute when you are talking about absolute reality the only language that is possible that we can use is the language of silence the absolute reality can be explained only through one language and that is the language of silence so i can uh, there is a very famous very celebrated verse in the rigveda samhita antaye bahuvadinam anantaye mukam means the language of the finite is verbosity the language of the infinite is silence so antaye bahuvadinam if it is something relative something which can be described which can be defined which can be explained which can be put within the superstructure the framework of a definition you can write volumes you can write books you can give talks but if the if it is something which is beyond words there is only one language that can be used and that is the language of silence so antaye bahuvadinam anantaye mukam then the question arises i the, i already dealt with subjects what about the upanishad the shastra etc why should we discuss why should we read we are reminded of the reality beyond words by the upanishads the upanishads alone can be bold enough to say we cannot explain the reality if a book tells you well this book contains the truth that truth cannot be eternal that truth that truth can only be relative so only the relative can be explained as moving or unmoving the absolute cannot be explained as either moving or unmoving and this as i quoted last time in the in the famous srishti sukta it is called nasadiya sukta nasadasi nosadasi tadanim etc i mentioned the sages went in search of the absolute reality and ultimately they had to turn their attention inward they had to turn their investigation inward and then they found out that cannot be explained it is their own inner essence now to drive home this point the upanishad uses these two terms it is neither moving 
no run movie. So it says, no, that the age of the, that Atman is moving. As I said last time, Atman is moving, Atman is so unmoving. As the absolute reality, this Atman is, is beyond anything which may be called movement. At the same time, is this Atman something which is which cannot move? A stone doesn't move. A tree doesn't move unless there is strong wind. Atman is like that. In fact, no less a philosopher like than even Aravinda sometimes puts a very, very, if you don't mind, a foolish statement. Shankara's Advaita, Shankara's Brahman is inactive like a stone. Uh, Aravindo was a great mystic, but there are many uh, unacceptable statements in Aravindo's philosophy. Now, what Shankara means is, what Dubanishas mean is this. In its absolute dimension, this Atman is omnipresent, omnipotent, all-pervasive. Then what about we beings? What about a tree? What about man? Without the presence of Atman, no one can move. At the same time, Atman itself is unmoving. In a relative sense, there, is no, there can be nothing in this world without Atman being present within them. At the same time, Atman itself is not something which moves from one place to another because it is all pervasive. So, that idea is put, in the relative sense, Everything in this world is Atman. Everything that moves in this world is Atman. Without the presence of the Chaitanya, the consciousness, the Atman, nothing can exist in this world. It is called, you know, when Atman is present, it is called dead body. It is in Sanskrit, we call it Shava. When Atman is present, it is called Shiva. means Shiva is that which has got consciousness. So it is said, that's why I, I was quoting that sloka from the Gita. I, perhaps I didn't explain it. I shall explain. Karmanya karmaya pashir a karmanicha karmayaka sa buddhiman manishesu sa yukta krishna karma karma. In the Advaitic commentary, it goes far beyond our present context. I shall say this much. Those who have reached the highest level of spiritual realization can see and experience action in actionlessness and can experience actionlessness in action. Because even we are, when we are active, even we are doing everything, moving, having a dinner, speaking, teaching, studying, in all these activities, we can, a Jivan Mukta, a man of the highest spiritual realization, who has experienced the reality of Atman, can have the feeling, well, I am beyond all these activities. As Atman, I am doing all this, but I am beyond all this. At the same time, there can be nothing in this world which is active, which is, uh, which is separate from the consciousness. Without the presence of that consciousness, Nothing in this world can work or move. See, Guru Sri Ramakrishna says, without, the, without, without his will, I mean God's will, nothing, not even leaf can move. Sri Ramakrishna says in the gospel. Guru Maharaj says in the gospel. So, in that sense, Tadi Ejati. See, everything that is related to, that we can see and experience as moving, acting, walking, studying, teaching, talking, all these actions are possible only with the presence of Atman within. In that sense, Atman is Ejati, it's moving. But in reality, that Atman is not limited to movement. Atman is not confined to movement. The movement doesn't limit Atman. In that sense, it is a Na Ejati. So, Tad Ejati, Tad Na Ejati. Atman moves, Atman doesn't move. In the relative sense, everything in this world, every action is possible only with the presence of Atman behind. At the same time, this action doesn't limit Atman. Atman is beyond both. So, Tadne Ejati. 
तदूरे तदु अंति की इट इज फॉर फॉर एवे एट द सेम टाइम इट इज क्लोज नाउ फॉर ए रैंग मेटेरियलिस्ट हु बिलीव्स दैट ईटिंग एंड ड्रिंकिंग एंड लिविंग एट द फिजिकल लेवल इज नॉट ऑल दैट्स मेंट 